Hi, I'm Jennifer Kling, and I love New Kids on the Block. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello, and welcome to Finding Favorites. It is actually still Saturday, but you'll be hearing this on Sunday. I recorded this episode today, and we'll get it posted before I go to bed because Sunday is vaccine number two day for me. I'll be driving back down to Springfield, Illinois for my second Pfizer shot. I'd originally thought when I went down to state for the shot that I would be one and done with Johnson and Johnson. That wasn't the case. And so I am heading back down state for shot number two. And I'm very excited because then everyone in my generation and my family and above will be vaccinated. I feel like it'll be a little bit safer to spend some time together this summer. And I'm very excited for that. Today's episode is one that I thought was just going to be about 80s and 90s nostalgia, but learned quickly that new kids on the block have a really vibrant career. And so I talk with Jen Kling all about new kids on the block. She is someone that I got to know When I was freelancing and I was working for SAP for their CX group, worked on a couple events in Barcelona and Orlando and met Jen at those. And when I put the call out for people ready to come and talk about their favorite things or things they love, and uh, she was volunteered by our mutual friend, Amy, who you'll remember from the Disney episode. So this is just really fun. And after talking to Jen, I'm ready to go on a cruise can't believe we're at the point in the pandemic where I am thinking cruises sound like a good idea again. Uh, I think anything with a lot of people just having fun and loving the same thing just sounds really good to me right now. So I'll keep this short. I need to go to bed and rest up for my long drive tomorrow. So wear your mask, wash your hands, stay safe. Hello and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and this is the podcast where we get recommendations and find out about people's favorite things without using an algorithm. Today, I am joined by Jen Kling. Jen and I met each other for the first time in Barcelona when I was working on events for SAP. It was called CX Live, and it was one of the nicest convention centers I've ever traveled to. So Jen, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. And wow, it's so funny to talk about doing live in-person events. Right? Way in the old days. In the before (laughs) times. In the before times when we would travel and see people in person. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, When we would wear like our business our business clothes with uh, tennis shoes to walk miles and miles across that convention center. Remember the day when we all got up and the rain was coming through the convention center? It was like a day before. Yes. Oh my goodness. That was crazy. That, That was also like, we had to, there was no way, I think you and I were at the same hotel. There was no Mm -hmm. way to get to the convention center without walking for a long time. Yeah. Outside. Like there wasn't, even if you did get an Uber for a minute and a half drive, you still had to walk five minutes outside. And so when it was raining, it was not a wonderful experience, but then you went inside and it didn't, and it was raining. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That was crazy. That was quite a week. It really was. That was one where I looked at that and I was like, Oh, I'm glad I'm just in charge of the speakers and the presentations. Yeah, right. <laughs> like that is not a problem I have to solve, but that was so stressful. Yeah. It was good times though. Yeah. I miss that. Oh, I miss in-person events and the one of the things I loved about being on the CX team for those two events cuz it was I did Barcelona and then the the first CX live and well, probably the last one because it was actually like October 2019, yeah. right? Yeah. When we were in Orlando. And that was just a few short months before 
COVID started. Yeah. So, but I loved being on a big team, working towards a singular goal, getting together in person, making it happen. It was so mm-hmm. stressful. But the feeling of like pulling that off and getting to do that twice with your team, I loved. It was so, I loved it. Yeah, it's the best. I've I've been in marketing for oh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> a lot yeah. of years, many, many years. And um, it's I've always been attached to events in one way or another. I was an event planner for a long time. And so it was on the logistics side. And now I mostly just kind of participate from like a speaker and doing sessions and mm-hmm. things like that. But I just absolutely love it. There is something about that very last stretch when you look around and everything is still a mess Mm -hmm. and you've got workers everywhere and things are still being constructed and you're looking at the clock and you're going, there's no way this is going to come together. And then it does. And it's like the most amazing, most satisfying feeling. I love it. Such a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have obviously moved online this year. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. What, how has that been? You know, it's, um, it's a different experience, right? It's, you know, in fact, the group I'm with now, um, Litmus has their uh, virtual event coming up now, SAP Litmus. And um, we're doing this virtual five track, 25 sessions, one day event. And, wow. um, you know, it's, it's, just a different type of experience. You know, you, you, you know, you do cameras on with zoom and the technology is great now, but it doesn't really replace that in-person, um, interaction and the networking, right. We'll have like a virtual networking lounge and stuff like that, but it's just, it's not the same. It it works. And thank goodness we have the technology we have now. I mean, if we were doing this in the eighties or the nineties, you know, I don't know how we would have done it. I mean, we just wouldn't have. Right. It's it's just a different experience, but it works. It works, you know. Thank yeah. goodness for technology. Yeah, <laughs> I having a product where you can quickly call people. You're not looking for their phone number. It's you're not having to get people the, you know, just having a link to click on, and the chat has ba- made a huge difference. Because even totally. if we just, I don't know, like a month before, we just each had our our dial in numbers. Right. Even a year and a half ago, how we could have accomplished what we've accomplished. You know, it's funny because, I mean, you know how SAP is. We're Mm -hmm. we're a global organization. We have people everywhere and teams are made up from people that are spread across the world. And even even the small team I'm on, I have people in, I'm in California, half the teams in California, I have people in Birmingham, Arizona, and Australia. And, you know, so we were kind of used to always being on a zoom call or a team's call with people and, you know, doing camera on a lot just because it's nice to be able to see those people. But I will say that now that all of us have been working from home and there isn't half of us that are together in the office and Mm -hmm. like the other half of the team, not, I feel like it's in a weird way, brought the whole team closer together. Absolutely. And, you know, we're all in on something together and, you know, I have mixed feelings about the office now. Like I, I want to go back because I miss the people Mm -hmm. and our office is nice and we have free lunch and I miss the impossible burgers, but you know, (laughs) yeah. I don't miss the, I mean, my commute wasn't bad as a 35 minute commute and as the area commutes goes, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. But it's kind of nice to not have to have that commute and not have to put makeup on and be able to work in my, in, you know, in my sweats or whatever. Yeah. But I do miss people. So it's, it's going to be interesting for us. They're saying, you know, they'll support whatever works for any individual through the end of the year. And they're, they're starting to work on a controlled reopening of the mm-hmm. offices, but it'll still be very limited. And, and for me, since I only have a few members of the team in the office, if we all can't be there on the same day because our desks are in too close proximity or whatever, it's kind of like, well, then what will the point be in going in? Right. So, so we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. I want to go back if we have uh, my perfect vision is Tuesdays and Wednesdays are all in days. We mm-hmm. all go on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So we have dead. We've got in person, but we're all there to really mix with each other. And then if if you want to come in more days than that, 
um, great, but I want like a couple days where we, where we all try, but right. But then that breaks the safety protocols. Yeah. Possibly. So yeah, it'll be interesting. You know, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. For (laughs) us, it's been, we used to only have one member of our team who was in New York and we'd get into a meeting and I was like, oh man, did somebody call Shannon? Oh, like we forgot about her all the time. (laughs) And now that we're all like, we've never been closer to her because we we're like all on the same page and we're so, so I will have to be really mindful that we don't forget about Shannon when we go back in in person, (laughs) you know? Well, and I don't think you will, I, because there's, you know, it's, it's brought this whole new awareness Mm -hmm. of, you know, what it feels like to be remote because now we're, we've all lived it. Yeah. And so people who were already remote, we, we have a more, you know, empathy, if you will, um, for them. So I think you won't, you won't forget Shannon. I'm not even going to forget Shannon. You're not going to forget Shannon. Yeah. <laughs> have, have you in this uh, year at home picked up any hobbies or any new habits that are, are exciting? I don't know, or are boring yeah. or yeah. TV shows? Um, you know, we did a lot of the same thing that everyone was doing. We went through several puzzles, Mm -hmm. um, made several loaves of banana bread, Mm -hmm. never got into the sourdough starter thing, but I did purchase a Peloton. Yeah. In fact, when at the end of 2019, when there was that whole scuttlebutt about that commercial they had, and then Ryan Reynolds did like his amazing clap back to it, which was he's like a marketing genius. But, um, I, at the time was telling my husband, like, I want one, like, Hey, I, I won't complain if you get me one for Christmas. Yes. You know? <laughs> um, and so I was talking about it then. And I wished I really wish I had done it then. Right. Because then by the time I did it, so did everyone the, else in the country. <laughs> and the delivery times were very long. Yeah. It took two months to get here. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, but once it got here, I have it, you know, almost every day, not every day, but I, you know, I love, I love writing. I love the, if, if we were going to do a second podcast of uh-huh. things that I love, like Peloton would be but my next topic. Great. Um, but I absolutely love it. Um, all the classes. So but I would you, say that's the biggest habit I picked up. Cause I also got one and I got it in maybe uh-huh. November and I, I would say I write it right now about five days a month. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a challenge last month and I, after like five or six days, fell off the wagon because I'm trying to figure out like, how do I make the rides less precious? So I do them Mm -hmm. like I don't get I don't psych myself out from them Mm -hmm. that a five minute ride is okay. You know, Mm -hmm. like getting on the bike is better than not getting on the bike. Absolutely. And I just I haven't. I don't know if I've got it in the wrong room. Like maybe I do need it in my living room or closer to my desk or like more in my life than in my guest bedroom. Mm-hmm. What was the thing about Peloton that you were really just like made you fall in love with it? Was there a teacher? Yeah. Was there like, were you a spinner before? So yeah, I used to years ago. Um, I used to love doing spin classes. Um and, you know, over like the last couple of years, there was this, this trend popped up of where it was just cycling classes that were opening up, like the soul cycle. And yeah. the, um, there was a flywheel near me and, um, and I loved doing that. So I always liked spinning and my problem has always been in general is finding the time to work out. Yeah. And I like the idea of having something in my home so that mm-hmm. I can do it whenever. So that, and like, especially like since I've been working from home, if I have an hour between calls and I yeah. need to sort of clear my mind, I will hop on the bike for 20 minutes and do a ride. Yeah. So I, and you know, if I gets to the end of the day and I do this a lot, I, my preference is to work out in the morning, mm-hmm. but that happens maybe twice a month. But if I get to the end of the day and it's eight 30 at night, yeah, I'll hop on the bike because I can. It's it's there. Yeah, and instead of you know, I would never go to the gym at eight thirty at night. No, <laughs> never. Not, that's not going to happen. No. You know, it's like the time it takes to get there and everything. So, I think for me, it was just a matter of just setting a commitment. I'm also very, you know, there's all the badges that you can get, right? And the streak, and that 
drives me. Like, for example, today I just finally hit my 60 day streak. Nice. And got that, it was the longest day streak I think that you can get. Literally, I've been like, well, I can't. There was a day this week that I wasn't going to work out. And I said, well, I have to. I'm I'm four days away from getting right. my 60 day streak. I can't yes. start all over again. Like I've done so many times. So that drives me too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think starting off short and small, because when I first got started, I mean, I was at the heaviest I had been in my whole life mm-hmm. and it was hard to move. Uh, I just started off with like short 20 minute low impact classes yeah. and just work my way up. Um, in July, I, so my bike arrived the first week of June and I think it was mid to late July. I discovered the power zone training. Yeah. I, I see that in my Facebook group. Yes, it is. I cannot recommend it enough. So there's a program, there's a collection of the yeah. power zone training. I only did like the first two or three weeks of it until I got the hang of it. But what's great about it is it's all about training at your fitness level. Mm-hmm and gradually working just above that. And, and there's the, each zone has its purpose. So whether it's training at your fitness level, just above your VO two max, your blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, what I think is so great about that is many of the classes on Peloton, when you're looking at them, you can't tell what the focus is of Mm -hmm. the class. And so many of them are almost like an all out every time. And that, isn't necessary yeah. for, for fitness, for whatever, you know, whatever your fitness goals are. So I, that's, I, I can't speak highly enough of, of the, uh, power zone, uh, training. And, and for the power zone training, do you need a heart monitor? No, it's actually all about, in fact, people often get confused between heart rate zone and the powers and the power zone. Oh. So they're completely unrelated. Okay. Um, so what you do is you start by taking what they call an FTP test mm-hmm. and uh, it's like fitness threat, fitness threshold. Profile. Like Profile. I don't know, something Let's like call that. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a, you take a 20 minute, you first do warm up, you do like a 10 or 15 minute warm up class. Yeah. And then you take a 20 minute all out class. Okay. And what's great about it is, you know, Matt Whippers, who's one of the coaches, like yeah. his all out and my all out don't look anything the same. Right. Sure. Yeah. So it's all about whatever your all out means. And yeah. that comes back with what your average threshold is. And then okay. it gives you this power zone bar at the bottom of your screen that has seven zones. Oh. And Then what you do is you go through and you take the classes and there's actually a website, it's called, or a group, it's called, um, power zone pack and it's like powerzonepack.com and they have challenges and different things Mm -hmm. that you can go through. Um, but you can, you take these classes and maybe like in the beginning after like eight weeks of consistently doing at least three power zone classes in a week, take your FTP test again, and then you can see your improvement. Okay. So I love, I love looking at the stats and the numbers and the data and seeing, you know, how I've improved. And it's great because you'll start off and you'll just do some short endurance rides, Mm -hmm. which, um, I've, I had a friend who tried it and she was like, it's too easy. I'm like, but you're not, it's, you know, it's about training. It's about time and intensity. Right. And so it's not supposed to be breathtaking every time. Right. So it's, it's great. I, I, it's, um, okay. it's a really, it, for me, it helped me kick, um, kick off my weight loss. And yeah. anytime I start to hit a plateau, I go back and I say, okay, I need to, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm drifting off into these fun rides too much. I need to come back into power zone training and, and, and yeah. focus on that. Cause it's a total plateau buster. Now, have you done, uh, I see a lot of people talk about getting like a, a fitting from Matt Wilper's team. Have you ever done that? I have. Yeah. Game and it was worth changer. it. changer. Yeah. Okay. I could not believe the adjustments that they made weren't the adjustments that I thought were needed. Okay. Um, everything. They even look at how your, uh, the your clip cleats. on your shoe yeah. are positioned and they, so they have you. <laughs> it's practically a workout, but they'll have you do like some movements beforehand. So like uh, a plank and like, I I can't remember the stuff that they'll have you do just to kind of get a sense. So like I, I have scoliosis, so I'm a little uneven. 
Mm-hmm. And so I've got one hip that's higher than the other, all this stuff going on. And so they can see all of that. And then they, and then they watch you pedal. So like the first 10 minutes, I think was of him just watching me move. Interesting. Um, and then have you pedal and they watch your pedaling. And then he just starts with the adjustments. And there were so many things like he had me move the seat back and I'm super short. So I uh-huh. thought like I had my, the first thing I did when I set it up was have the move seat it. all the way forward because yeah. my legs are short. Nope. He had me move the seat back, all sorts of things. So um, the okay. tilt of the seat was wrong. I mean, just things that I never would have thought of. Um, okay. He had my cleats set differently for each shoe. Oh, and in my head, I'm thinking, you know, they should be symmetry. Even. Yeah. But no, because my legs aren't <laughs> right. So it was so worth it. I mean, okay. you know, we make this investment already in the bike. Might yeah. as well make a little bit more adjustment, you know, investment in mm-hmm. the making sure that you're, you're fit properly. It's totally worth it. All right. Okay. I'll do it. So as a segue, (laughs) has there been an NKOTB? We're here today to talk about new kids on the block. Yes. AKA NKOTB. Yes. Has there been, is there, has there been an artist series of uh, new kids? There has not. However, one of my absolute favorite coaches, Cody Mm -hmm. Ridsby, um, he has a class that he did. It's a 45 minute ride. And the second half of the class, he did half new kids on the block, half backstreet boys. So he would just, he went nice. new kids backstreet and that was amazing. Um, and you know, you can search for, by uh, artists. Mm-hmm. And so I, one of the very first things I did when I got my bike was search and bookmarked every class where there was a new kids on the block song. Um, <laughs> I love it. Um, so yeah, but no new kids artist series yet, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping. (laughs) Fantastic. So we're here to talk about new kids on the block. Let's time travel. How did you discover them? We're going to go back. We're getting into the, um, DeLorean. Is that what the car was? Yes. We're getting in the DeLorean. Yes. Uh, we're going to get in the DeLorean. We're going back to 1989, 88. Yeah. And I was 13, 14. Mm -hmm. And they were the biggest thing since the Beatles. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I was buying the magazines and I was buying the cassette tapes Mm -hmm. and I was listening to them nonstop and begging my mom to let me put the posters up in my room. And did she let you, she did only a little bit. She didn't like the like tape on the walls Uh and stuff like that. So, cause it was a rental and she was worried that she'd have to paint that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Fair. And so, um, but yeah, so I was a huge fan and I had, you know, I had my group of girlfriends. There was, Mm -hmm. we were a group of six and we were all fans and, you know, does that mean you each picked a, 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 so two of you had to do double duty. Two of us had double duty and it worked out really well because everybody liked a different guy, except for me and my friend, Ellen, we were the Joe girls. Okay. And, you know, we've fought over him like you wouldn't believe and uh (laughs) but it was it was our life for a little while and then I remember we went um it was December 19 and 1989 I'm in the Bay Area Mm -hmm. grew up in Concord and they were in Sacramento at the Arco Arena okay and we got tickets and you have to keep in mind too that like I was 14 I didn't have a job. <laughs> right. Um, and my mom was a single mom raising three kids Yeah, and money was tight. And so to get tickets to go to a concert was a really big deal. Yeah. Um, and I think even like, I think my friend's parents might've actually got my ticket and then like we paid it back or something, but so it was a really big deal. Yeah. And so someone had to go and go to the mall and stand in line at the Ticketmaster booth <laughs> right? to get the tickets all together, right? Yes. You're not on the phone. Okay. Click now. Like, get yeah, this. Like, it doesn't, it didn't work that way. Kids. Somebody had to go get in line. So yes. it would make sense that one of the parents would take the hit would for the group. 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we, it was so different then, right? Oh my goodness. Kids today have no idea, but yeah. So we, um, we all piled into one of, and, and, you know, my friend's car. So there was, there were two of us that were like 14, two that were 16 at, or maybe three were 16. And then the oldest sister of my best friend, she was 18. Okay. So we all piled into all six of us into a Honda Civic. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. It's the eighties. It wasn't in a seatbelt. And we drove through the Sacramento Tully fog. And I swear it took us two hours to get there because the fog was so thick. She mm-hmm. could barely see. And, but for the new kids, it was worth it. And yeah. we got into the Arco arena and, you know, the seats weren't great. We were like on the very top deck, maybe like fifth row from the top, yeah. but off to the side of the stage and, you know, screamed and loved every second of it. And I know, like, I absolutely know that when Joey came out and was singing, please don't go girl to mm-hmm. our section. I mean, Ellen will say it was her, but it was me. He was looking straight at me, but absolutely, it was, it was um, yeah, it was amazing. It was like such an amazing experience. And then, you know, it was 89. And then I think in 90, maybe late 90, 91, grunge started coming onto the scene yeah. and the music scene was changing. We were growing older. They were growing older. They wanted to new do new music, different things. And so mm-hmm. they came out with an album that I think we just weren't ready for. I think I, what was I starting to listen to then? Maybe I was starting to listen to like Depeche Mode by then or something like that. So just everything changed. And then they broke up and they went away. And it was such a short time really that they were so huge. Yeah. And then, um, you know, through the nineties, they all did their own solo stuff. I didn't really think about them much. I think when the first things I'm trying to remember from a timeline standpoint, Donnie Wahlberg was in sixth sense. And I remember going to see that movie in the theater, watching the movie and then seeing the credits and seeing his name in the credits. I'm like, what, who was Donnie Wahlberg in the movie? Uh Do you know who he was in the movie? No. So have you, you've seen sixth sense, right? No, but I know the twist. Okay. Because I, I use the internet. (laughs) <laughs> okay. So, and you know, so spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, um, <laughs> uh, you are allowed to talk about a movie that was, uh, spoiled by Jay Leno, you know, millions of years ago. Millions of so, years ago. So Donnie Wahlberg played the patient who shoots Bruce Willis in the beginning of the movie. Oh, and then shoots himself, but he lost something like 60 pounds or something. So it was unrecognizable. Wow. He was super skinny and feel really amazing performance for a short time on screen. You know, I can't say it's a small role because it's pivotal to the entire right. premise of the movie, but it was really amazing. So that was incredible. I was like, wait, Donnie's an actor now. Huh. And Jordan was doing his solo music yeah. and was on MTV TRL all the time. And Joey was doing solo music and he was on MTV TRL all the time. And, um, but you didn't have the internet. So it was hard. It wasn't right. like today where you just follow them on social media. So it was hard to keep up with what they were doing. And then I'm growing up and trying mm-hmm. to live on my own and get a job and all that stuff. Yeah. And so it was hard to keep track. Um, I remember I once found out after the fact that Joey had done a concert at the Concord Pavilion and I literally lived down the street Uh. from the pavilion and I didn't know he was going to be there. And I found out after I was devastated, devastated Mm. because of course, you know, it was before either one of us were married, I could have met him and then we could have gotten married and had millions of children together. (laughs) I missed my chance. Yeah. But at least Ellen also didn't know. Right. Exactly. Well, and when Ellen got married, uh huh, she got married before I did. And so at that point I said to her at her wedding, I'm like, this means that Joe is mine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you outlast, so, you tricked her. You outlasted. Yep, exactly. So time went on and then Joey was on uh, dancing with the stars, the premiere season of dancing okay. with the stars. And you know, when like, oh my goodness, the stars were bigger, right? Yeah. Were, were people who you were so excited to see back. 
yeah, um, who you hadn't followed. And so he, that is a really exciting announcement that a teenage celebrity crush and someone so who is like meant so much to you when your brain was forming mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, was going to be back on TV. Yeah. And, and he had done, and I should say he had done some other TV stuff as well. Like he was in a TV show called Boston common. I remember, yeah, Boston yeah. common. It was like about a school or something. Mm-hmm. He was a teacher for like a season and a half or something. Um, but yeah, to, to be on dancing with the stars and then for me to be able to support him right. and, and vote for him. And he made into the top three and, you know, he was so amazing. And I remember talking to one of my girlfriends and I was like, he's so great. He's perfect. He should win. And she's like, I don't know. He seems kind of stiff. I'm like, you just bite your tongue. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, it was amazing. And then so that was like 2000s. That was in the 2000s, like mid 2000s, I think 2006, maybe. Yeah. 2006. And, he was in Dancing with the Stars. Yeah. And then and they so did then, a tour. Did you go so to the tour? I did not. And I don't know that Joey participated in that. I, I don't, I'm not sure, but I did not do that. Um, but then in 2008, there was this teaser on mm. their website that something was going to come. Ooh. And then it was announced that they were going to be on the Today Show. And I can't remember now the full exact sequence of events, mm-hmm. but they released an album. There was a new, new song that they premiered on the Today Show. They announced they were doing this album. They were gonna do a tour. They performed on the Today Show. And it was like, whoa, what's, what's going on here? Yeah. Like, this is amazing. And you've got like these feelings of mm-hmm. like oh, my favorite band from when I was 14. And so, you know, I wasn't as close to the girls that I grew up with um, yeah. anymore. They're, you know, we've, everybody's scattered, you know, that happens. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but I had, you know, my new besties and we were like, well, we, you know, they were all friends or, you know, fans as well back mm-hmm. in the day. We just didn't know each other. So I was like, well, I mean, we got to go, right. We got to see, we got to go at least one show and see if they still have the right stuff. Yeah. Sorry. I can't help that. <laughs> um, and so we did, we got tickets and a group of us got together. We had dinner, we talked and we, we joked a little bit, like, do you think they could still do it? Like, can they still do a whole tour? I mean, we're all kind of old now, like, right. you know, we weren't, but, um, And so, you know, it was really, we just thought it was just kind of a nostalgia thing. We loved Mm -hmm. the album. We loved the songs and we went and again, didn't have amazing seats. Mm -hmm. We were in like the second deck. This is in San Jose at the, I think it was called the HP Pavilion at the time. Now it's SAP Center, ironically. (laughs) Um, And we were like on the second deck still the the same side of the stage Mm -hmm. that I was on with my one show that I went to when I was a kid. Yeah. And when Joey came out and started singing and it was like, Oh my God, I'm 14 all over again. Like this feeling just came over me, this Mm -hmm. like rush of adrenaline. And I was screaming and I'm screaming. I love you, Joey. As Uh, if you can hear me. Right. And it was just, we had such an amazing time and it was such an amazing show. And then afterwards we were like, uh, we need another show. Yeah. <laughs> and we had screwed up because they had been in Sacramento the night before. So it was like, we could have gone to Sacramento last night and then Saturday right. night, which there wasn't much left of the tour. And so we were sure, like, but when you bought the tickets, you were like, we're going to go see these people who are a little bit older than us try Mm -hmm. and sing and dance. And it it Mm -hmm. might be embarrassing. Mm -hmm. We might be embarrassed. Yes. So we should only go once. I didn't even tell my coworkers what I was doing. (laughs) This was like a secret. (laughs) I was at the office and I had to leave the office early. And I remember I changed my clothes from like, it was, you know, I was more professionally dressed. I was Mm -hmm. literally suited up and I had to change into jeans and whatnot. 
And I'm like, oh, I, I'm leaving early today. And people are like, what, what we got going on? Oh yeah, just, you know, hang out with some friends, just, you know, going up for dinner, meeting in San Jose, bye. And I, I didn't tell anyone. It was, right. I kept it a secret. I was like, I can't, can't tell anybody. This is embarrassing. And so then, yeah, we went to the show and then we were like, well, we got to go to another show. So we're looking at what's left of the tour. And we're like, well, we could go to Seattle. It's three days before Thanksgiving. Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. And uh-huh. so we did. We took a quick road trip to Seattle. And because it was last minute, we didn't have amazing tickets, but uh-huh. it was still that same rush of feeling. And I don't know why I thought that was going to be it, but it was not it. Okay. It was not it. It was the start of <laughs> this is the start of it. It's just the start of it. <laughs> well, right. It could have been that it was only your group that were like, this was fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you go to Seattle mm-hmm. and then the tour ends a couple weeks later. The tour ended a couple weeks later. Okay. And then, you know, I would imagine for them, the group that they were even like, huh, that went a little better than we thought it would. Sure. <laughs> And there was so much demand. Mm-hmm. The fans were loving it. Because and now the fans are grown up, have mm-hmm, jobs, mm-hmm, have budget. Mm-hmm. The internet exists so you can co- better coordinate going. Yep. Well, and then you also have to think about 2008. That was when the economy was was in the tank. Yeah. Right? The finance market had tanked. Mm-hmm people's mortgages were, you know, everybody's underwater. Everybody was underwater. And so it was a stressful time. Yeah. And, you know, but it was also a hopeful time. Mm -hmm. I think it was just the right timing because there were, when you talk with different fans, Mm -hmm. you'll hear people say they saved my life. Right. Because they gave me something to enjoy at some of the most miserable time of times of my life. Right. Yeah. And you got there some people who are maybe going through divorces. They were either unemployed. They had yeah. th- taking care of parents now, like so many things going on uh-huh. that the timing really was perfect. It just kind of happened. I think, I don't think they did it intentionally. I don't think they said the economy's in the tank. Let's make a comeback. Um, oh, you don't but- think any of their houses were underwater and their first round of NKOTB money was maybe I don't think so actually <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, Donnie had a great career going. I think Blue Bloods was just getting started at that time. He had just been in a movie with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Like Donnie was doing fine. Not slacking. Um, (laughs) Yeah, but I think all the guys were doing fine. Um, But it just, the timing happened to work. Actually, uh, there's a lot of interviews about it, but Donnie will talk about part of what the timing was because he was going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. And so he started pouring himself into music and writing music. And so Mm. that started that I think that kind of spawned the timing. Uh, so he needed it. He will actually say he needed it just differently, different reasons right. why others did. So, yeah. So then they were like, let's throw together another tour. And mm-hmm. so then they started another tour. I remember they did a um, performance on the Jimmy Kimmel show. Okay. And it was going to be in like that little outdoor theater that he has. Yeah. And it was like in April. And one of my friends and I were like, let's road trip. Why not? Yeah. And so we took a few days off of work, drove down to LA. Uh, I had a friend who knew someone who worked on the Jimmy Kimmel show. Mm -hmm. So she helped us get a better spot, not like front row, but like third or fourth. And so that was amazing. And then, yeah, then when the tour kicked off, I think I did like three shows back to back, but what we had discovered with this second tour Mm -hmm was that the new kids do these meet and greets Okay. before the concert. And oh. So you buy a ticket yep. and you have to be quick because they sell out. So really fast, fast, I'm sure. Yeah. And we were like, well, we got to do that. Yeah. And so we did. And um, did you do meet and greets was- for just one show? You were like, or did you do multiple meet and greets on that tour? So, yeah, (laughs) I wish so I don't publish the video of this interview of these interviews. But the face you just made, I wish I could have a gif of it. It was (laughs) tremendous Uh, and suggest to me 
uh, maybe you went to more than one meet and greet. Yeah. If you were to ask me, so the new kids tour every, in the beginning, it was for a few years, every year. And then it's been every other year. Yeah. If you were to ask me how many meet and greets I've done. Okay. I don't know. I <laughs> can't count that high. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so you're a, you're, what you're saying is you are a fast clicker. I'm a fast clicker. There are some people who are faster at clicking than I am, but yeah. I am a fast clicker and I have done many meet and greets Great. and each tour I do a, at least a few. Okay. And you know, the meet and greet experience is it takes this whole relationship with the new kids yeah. to a new level. Absolutely. You get to see them and talk to them for a fraction of a second. It feels like, I mean, it's, yeah. it's longer, but it's, you know, you're talking 30 seconds to two minutes. It's not right. You're not hanging out with them for an hour. You get a, you get a hug from each guy mm -hmm. and you know, and you pass your phone to someone, right. To get oh, photos of it or. So it's, it's highly, it's super, um, organized. So you actually go through and there's a company, there's a photographer who does okay. the, the photos Yeah. so they can move through. Cause they probably do, they probably meet a thousand to 2000 fans a night. I mean, it's wow. like super fast. Yeah. I can't even imagine what the experience is like for them because we go in and you know, the fans organize ahead of time. We're yeah. like, okay, we're looking for two Joe girls and a Danny girl. And, and you, you get in and you line up, you find mm -hmm. out the order that there's, and then you line up in that order. Okay. With, you know, Joe girls, Jordan girls, Donnie girls, and you go that way. So you so line up you with your competition, in, you line up with your competition All right. and you, <laughs> and you walk in and you hug each guy, you say a word and then you get to the end of the line and you, you stop at your guy and each girl goes on or each person. There are yeah. male fans. Sure. Um, each person stands on either side of the new kid and then they take two pictures super quick. And then like you turn, you say maybe one or two other words uh -huh. and then you move on and then you, you hug the new kids that you hadn't gotten to in line yet. And then you okay. head out. And so that whole thing is like two minutes. Wow. So I've done several mm -hmm. and, um, you know, usually what people will ask me that I haven't given you an opportunity to ask, but you're probably wondering is, well, do they know you by now? Yeah. People are how are your, me that. how are your chances with Joey now that <laughs> yeah. you've been, that you've paid many times to meet him? Right. Do you like wear the same outfit so he can start to like piece it together in his head? Do you, have you slid into his DMs? <laughs> like... Yeah, I can't even tell you. Like <laughs> the funny thing is, and I actually have a girlfriend who jokes because anytime I post like on Instagram or something, pictures from the past um, of meet and greets between my hair changes, my weight fluctuations, uh -huh. and then like, you know, with sometimes a year or even two years going by before they see you again, mm -hmm. it's, I've made it impossible for him to recognize me because right. I'll go from like pixie haircut, super long hair, uh -huh. shoulder length, Bob, you know, and having weight fluctuate, you know, yeah. you know, 70 pounds or whatever. And <laughs> so I've made it impossible for him to be able to recognize <laughs> me. So, but there are people that have, you know, there are some fans who have like a shtick to mm -hmm. get recognized yeah. um, and that has worked for them. And then there are some people that for whatever reason have clicked and have genuinely become friends mm -hmm. with the guys. Um, I, I have not. Okay. Um, and I, I am not smart. <laughs> so I, I, I go into these meet and greets and for a while after I had already done a few, I think in my head, I was like, oh, Joey and I are best friends now. Uh -huh. And so then we would go through and it, it, without fail, the other Joe girl in my meet and greet would be like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. This is the first time I'm meeting him. And I'd be all like, oh, it's no problem. I'll, I got you. And so we go through and I'd be like, hey, Joe, I'm Jen. We've met before, but this is so-and-so and this is her first time. And I'd be like, okay, you two talk. And I just stand there. You are and, an outstanding wing woman. And uh, I, that's a terrible way to make him fall in love with you. 
It really is. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so, yeah, so there was that. And then a couple years ago, Joe did um, like this little, they always do when they're off tour, they'll do like some side solo projects. Mm-hmm. So Joe did these um, shows at the hotel cafe in LA and super small venue, very intimate, um, amazing shows. Yeah. And he did these meet and greets that were either before or after the show, depending on the time of the show. And maybe, maybe there were 50 people that were doing these meet and greets, Yeah, maybe, but so much smaller group, super relaxed. It was with your phone. Like you get up there. So we're standing in line waiting and one of my friends is with me and I'm like, record it. I want to see, you know, these things always go so fast and I want to be able to remember it, you know? So, so she's like, she records it for me. I get up there. I hand the, his assistant or whoever it was, my phone to take the picture. I say something to him. He says something back. I even see in the video, I see like his face of like, Oh, I recognize her. Yeah. And he's like, Hey, how you doing? And I'm like, Oh, whatever I said. And he said something back and we hug and we take the picture. I take my phone. I look back. I say, see you next month and walk away. And you literally see this look on his face where he's like, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> The video is like 13 seconds. Uh There was, there was no rush. I had one of my best friends next. She wasn't going to be all like, come on now. Uh There was was no reason for me to rush through, but I did. Yeah. I am not very smart. (laughs) That is, but what I think is happening in your head is you, that is your event marketer brain taking over you're thinking through the logistics you're you are organizing on behalf of his manager how this night has to run smoothly right. and how everyone has to behave for everyone to have an optimal experience and you are modeling the behavior that you wanted to see from the people in front of you yes exactly and me yeah <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if this is a You are allowed to cuss. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's amazing. <laughs> so I would say so this last tour, so right, so they came out in 2008 and they're still touring. Like I said for the first like maybe 4 years, 3 years, I think they toured every year and then they started doing every other year. Mm-hmm. And what I've been trying to do is in the off year that they're not touring is to make sure that I go on to the new kids cruise. Please tell me more. There's a cruise. <laughs> yeah. Just so you know, I had a guest on, Jenny Sellis, uh-huh. who performs as the Klingon pop warrior. So she goes on the Star Trek cruise every year and performs in Klingon. So you are not the first person to come on who has gone on a fan cruise. All right. I can guarantee that the Star Trek cruise is nothing like the New Kids cruise. Okay. Um <laughs> Do the new kids go on the cruise? Yes. So that okay. is the that is the number one question everyone always asks. Right. When you bring up the new kids cruise. Yes, they are on the cruise okay. the whole time. All right. And yes, you do see them. And so basically, what happens is there are activities during the day, and then every night they have something. So like the first night, usually they do like a game show in the theater, and they have mm-hmm. to split the they have to split the ship up in two because the theaters aren't big enough for right. the whole ship because no one does that. And so they they do that, and then they have one night's a concert, and then like sometimes some cruises they've done like a solo thing. So like Joe would do a little solo show, mm-hmm. Jordan would do a little solo show, things like that. Danny, and then every night there's a party on the Lido deck. Okay, and the party doesn't start until like midnight. Oh boy! Now I'm I mean I'm not old, but I'm in my mid forties. I yeah. don't start things at midnight no but (laughs) for some reason I you find the energy on these cruises to do it and and the the party goes until like three in the morning Uh four in the morning and the guys come out and there's a different theme every night and some Mm -hmm. people get dressed up I'm not one of the ones that gets like 
super, I I'm all about kind of like simplicity when it comes to abiding by the theme. Uh If I can abide by the theme in just a t-shirt, I will do that. Okay. But some people will go all out. Like one year they had like your favorite TV character. Right. And so people will, you know, if, so if I was a Star Trek fan, like maybe I would actually dress as a Klingon for example. Um, and, you know, so some people will go all out, but I'm like more of a, you know, if it's a, something I can get with a t-shirt, I'm good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because I'm also a very practical person and I yes. like to pack light. Is this a Caribbean cruise or like a Yucatan? It's usually the Bahamas. There were okay. two years where they did Mexico out of New Orleans. Yeah. Um, one year they did uh, out of New York and it went to, I don't know. The destination's not even like, it doesn't, doesn't even matter. matter. Like they <laughs> could go out in just the middle of the ocean and we all be like, whatever. Right. <laughs> there are some people when you, when you, when we get to the port, some people don't even get off the ship. They just sleep all day. Um, yeah. I think if you are dancing on the Lido deck until three in the morning with the new kids on the block. Yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing. And then they do like, they do have a meet and greet. The meet and greet on the ship goes even faster than it does during the tours. Sure. Um, and I feel so bad for the guys because it's such a long day for them, but it's amazing. It's an amazing experience. It's so much fun. You know, you go with your girlfriends and you just have a blast. Now you're not like literally having breakfast with Jordan or anything. Yeah. And you're not, you know, but but you see them wandering about the ship yeah. and, you know, kind of the code is be cool when you see them, like mm-hmm. don't rush them. If you're, you know, if a crowd starts to form, don't start pushing. And as long as the fans are cool, then the security will be cool. And yeah. you know, they'll take selfies all day long. And, you know, and, you know, when you get 2,500 women on a ship, yeah. it doesn't always stay cool, but yeah, but for the most part it does, especially as we get older, <laughs> have you, but it's amazing gotten any Joey selfies in those like casual, like at the breakfast buffet? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think so for the longest time, again, based on the other stories I've shared, this won't be surprising. It was almost as if I was like, I'm just going to wait for them to come to me. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't push my way through <laughs> the first few cruises I, I went on zero, zero Uh photos with the new kids, zero hugs from the new kids, because like a crowd forms around a new kid. And I hang out in the back as if Joey or Donnie are going to work their way through this crowd to come to me. Right. Oddly enough, never happened. No. So, but there, you know, I would say over the last few cruises, I got better at not being pushy, but being patient and working my way through and, and, you know, trying to get pictures. Um, there was one cruise where I managed to get a selfie with each one of the guys, which was felt like this amazing accomplishment. And I was able to do so without, you know, having to like push anybody out of the side or anything crazy like that. So, but yeah, so it was amazing. I will say the last cruise we went on, uh, 2018, um, I did, um, I wouldn't say I came off the ship totally unscathed. I did um, have a incident coming down the water slide. Mm-hmm. Um, I come off the water slide and it was, you know, the, the, the ship's water, like in the pools and stuff, it's very salty. Yeah. And, you know, cause I guess it's coming from the ocean or whatever, but I wasn't prepared for that when I came down the water slide. So I was like, Oh, so it's kind of disoriented. And stepping out of the water slide, I slipped oh. coming down the steps. And uh-huh. I was, all I could imagine was that I was going to like hit my head on, there was like this ledge ahead of me uh-huh. and I thought for sure I was going to hit my head on it. So I had put my arms out in front of me to break my fall, which <sighs> they say never do. Right. So I, I fractured my elbow and somehow in the fall, when I fell forward, my legs kicked up behind me and my shins slammed against the edge of the step. Ah. So that hurt. And so then I, I'm like, Oh, my elbow, my elbow. And I turn over and I look at my, my right leg and my shin, I have a big old hole Ah. and I'm like, Oh my God. So I put my leg out and you know, one of the 
ship workers came over. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, no, my arm, my arm. He's like looking at it. And then he sees my leg and goes, Oh my God. I'm like, I know. <laughs> and then my, my, my friends comes off with the, the slide and she's like, Oh, that was fun. That was great. Oh, are you okay? I'm like, Oh, my arm. She's like, Oh, and then she looks at my leg and she's like, Oh my God. It's so. <laughs> oh no. So, so then like, you know, and then Joey have, came out of the crowd and lifted you in his arms. And, and he saved me. No, that didn't happen. Uh, but there was the worst part about this was there's, if you've ever been on the cruise, there's a camera that is on, on the Lido deck right. the whole, whole time. Yeah. So I later hear from people, oh, are you the one that fell? I was watching that on camera in my cabin. So I'm thinking at first, right? Like I fell and there's like four people in a hot tub nearby. I'm like, all right, not a lot of people saw this. Should right. be okay. No, like a lot of people saw this. Oh my God. And so I, it was, it was such a crazy experience. And so then I ended up having to go down to the ship's uh, like hospital, which is right. on the very bottom of the, of the ship. And which is really kind of cool experience. Cause it's not something you see. And they clean out the the wound, they x-ray my elbow, they wrap up my leg, they put my arm in like a splint and a uh, Uh brace or whatever. And I'm like, this is fortunately, it was the last day of the cruise. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I can still go to the Lido deck party tonight, right? (laughs) The doctor just looks at me. He's like, well, I don't think you should be standing, you know, you uh-huh. put a hole in your leg. I don't think you should be standing for like four hours until four in the morning. And I'm like, and really it's not even standing for four hours because the party starts at midnight, but yeah. like, we all go out there at like 10 o'clock because yeah. you want to have a decent spot. Cause the guys come out in the crowd and stuff and you right. want to hopefully, you know, see them. So he's like, I don't think you should be sitting. So I get a pass to sit in the ADA section. Ooh, Okay. Good plan. And <laughs> so I get to sit the whole time and I'm feeling kind of bad because I don't really feel like it's fair. Cause I'm, I'm generally able-bodied right. you know? and there are people who have, you know, lifelong, you know, mm-hmm. people who are in wheelchairs and, you know, I feel bad. Right. So, but I was kind of towards the back. I didn't take like, I didn't bring a chair and sit myself right in front of the ADA yeah. section or anything. I'm not that awful, but they had happened to move the ADA section that night to be right in front of like the stage where the guys hang out. Mm-hmm. So p- the previous nights, it was, they kind of had them in a not so great spot. They were right. just looking at the guys back the whole night. And so I just, so then it was like, I double locked out that they'd happened to move it. It's yeah. awful to say, but which was good. They should have had it there the whole time. So it was great. So then Jordan came through and Jordan, we had had the meet and greet that day. Okay. And so Jordan sees me because I'm basically, I'm still kind of, you know, I literally put my clothes back on my thing from the meat and green event, but he sees me and he's like, wait a second. And he looks at my arm. He's like, did that just happen? <laughs> and I and- go, yeah, stay off the water slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the question I haven't had the guts to ask them when I went through on all my meet and greets, um, from the tour that followed was whether or not they happened to see on the Lido deck camera, the yeah. girl who fell because that was me. You know, if I ever get my opportunity to have like a 15 minute coffee chat with one of them, I'm totally going to ask, but <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. I thought you were going to say that it was, uh, so I've only done one cruise and it was a Disney cruise. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember looking to see if there was like a closed caption. I don't think I ever like bothered turning the TV on. I thought you were going to say that like at the end when they were like, you know, because they take pictures through a cruise and you can buy your book of pictures. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that you're, you, they had like offered you the photograph of you like falling or <laughs> bleeding on the deck uh, that the photographer would have like tagged you in that. But how amazing would that have been? It would have been really good. But I also think finding out that you were, that everyone saw it as they were sitting in their room hungover is also pretty uh, wild. Yeah. And and I, I, I think probably on a new kids cruise, more people watch that quote unquote channel because like they're waiting to see when the crowd's starting to form. So they know they need to hurry and get out there. Right. But it was amazing how many people were walking up to me and they're like, oh, are you the one? I saw that. I, I couldn't believe it. Oof. 
the new kids were supposed to cruise in April of last year. Oh, yep. Gotta cancel that one. Yeah. And when it it's when things first started, I had friends who were like, oh, the cruise ain't happening. And I was like, it could happen. Hold out hope. It could happen. Uh This is going to blow over in a few weeks. Yeah. And then when, you know, then we had the shelter in place. It's like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to stay home for three weeks and then we're going to go on the cruise. Yeah. Then it'll be ready. We'll be good. It'll be fine. They'll test us all. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No. So yeah. um, So who knows when, when it'll happen again and then they were supposed to do a show at Fenway last year and they're supposed to be touring they were supposed to tour this year and all of that Uh, so right now Fenway is on the books for July and July in in like of 2021 yeah and Massachusetts is doing outdoor concerts but what's unclear is if it will be at full capacity the problem Mm -hmm. is the tickets are already sold. It's a sold out show. Right. So if they're going to do 50% capacity, uh, what you... half gets canceled, but then you factor in like, there's a lot of people who travel from Europe and like no one from Europe is getting out of Europe. So, right. you know, who knows what they're going to do, but I don't have a very, I'm extremely hopeful. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. So yeah. So you so have tickets been, to that Fenway show. Of course. Yes. Yeah. And who knows what's going to happen with the tour, but hopefully 2022, um, yeah. We'll be and who back. Knows, yeah. And who knows what meet and greets will look like when that starts back up? You yeah. Know, will that, will that be a thing? Will they still hug fans? Right. Will I still do a meet and greet if I can't hug them? I probably will. Yeah. I think, uh, because especially since now that I'm able to, you know, there's the meet and greet, but it usually comes along with a really good seat as well. Mm-hmm. And I like to be right up front. Right. Cause my vision's not so good anymore. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll still do those packages and yeah, we'll, but we'll see what happens with, yeah. with that experience. One last question. I know we're getting, we're getting close to time. What is your, what's your favorite song? Oh, so if I, can only pick one let's go pop well I'll let you go I'm top gonna, three how about top okay three? I, I'm gonna say my my favorite old song mm-hmm. is please don't go girl mm-hmm. oh I have a lot of favorites from their new stuff there's something about there's a song called defying gravity which they never play on tour I wish they would I love that song um it's on one of their newer albums and I also love click 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 uh, which was on their first album back. And okay. I, it might be because there's so much like sentiment and feeling attached to it from what they were doing when they were performing that song on the mm-hmm. tours and how that was the song that kind of, you know, made Donnie want to do the reunion and everything. So there might be, you know, something to that. Really that whole first album is amazing. That what's, first album. What's that new, reunion. what's it's called the, f- the yeah, the, it's called the block. The block. Oh, new kids on the block. Yep. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Um, but yeah, that that whole album, I absolutely love. You know, they're I love all. The, they've done multiple albums yeah. since then. Great. Um, I mean, they've they've been back longer than they were together. There were yeah, than they were the first time around. Uh, and they did. They've made more music this time around than they did the first time around. But yeah, so I, I would I would say that those are my favorites. That's so good. I I was aware that they had toured again. Mm-hmm. I don't think I was aware that they had were touring as more than a nostalgia band. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah and they do they do such a good job with the tours because they set the play the the set list so that it's a mix of the old stuff and the new stuff. Sure. Um. So they still. I. I mean, we joke this last tour in 2000, was that 18, 19, we would still meet people. They were like, Oh, this is my first show. And we're like, Mm -hmm. where have you been (laughs) for the last 11 years? And so there are still people who are rediscovering them for the first time, which I find amazing in like amazing, like how, but also just like, yes, I love that. You know, 
people are still continuing to rediscover them. The set list is always a mix of the new mm-hmm. and the old stuff, just to make sure that, you know, the casual fan recognizes taken care some of. of the songs. Yeah. 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 Well, Jen, is there anything about new kids about NKO TV that I haven't asked you about that if we hang up, you'll be sad. You didn't tell me. <laughs> um, you know, I think that what is so awesome about them is the relationship that they have with the fans. Mm -hmm. You know, they're active on social media. They're active in like side projects and connecting with the fans. Danny Wood does, has an organization called Remember Betty. Mm -hmm. um, And it's in honor of his mother who passed away from breast cancer. And he does a ton of fundraising and the fans have, you know, basically organized these different chapters to raise money for breast oh, cancer. Wow. And they, they do so much for, for people who are, are going through that to just provide things that they can't get elsewhere, you know, whether it's financial support mm-hmm. or other, other, um, su- other support means of support. And it's amazing work that he does and the fans support and, but then just, you know, everything that they do through social media and the connection they have with the fans, it's, you know, people talk about like Taylor Swift and Swifties Mm -hmm. and like Justin Bieber and Beliebers and, but it's, it's a much more genuine connection. I mean, they're, like I said, there have literally been fans who have become friends with members of the new kids and fans who have has started working for the new kids. Wow. Um, I mean, it's just, they truly have a connection. Um, Donnie is like truly the captain and he will, he remembers people um, and he reaches out to people and he's done things mm-hmm. that other artists won't, you know, don't necessarily do. Yeah. Um, you know, if somebody needs financial support or if somebody needs to get to a show and can't afford it and he hears about it, he'll buy them tickets and yeah. like front row tickets. And like, wow. they, they just have this amazing relationship with the fans um, that, you know, and can they consider us family? And if they hear about a blockhead, that's kind of what, Okay. <laughs> That's what we're called. I don't, I didn't come up with it, but you know, if, if they hear about a, a blockhead who's, you know, passed away or is going through something, you know, they're, they're there for them and they reach out and they, they send their best wishes and they mourn. Mm-hmm. And you don't often see that with, with artists and fans. Yeah. I, I think there's something really special to, because they were, People's number one bands as teenagers, they were teenage heartthrobs mm-hmm. and then they got to go away and have their twenties and mm-hmm. part of their, th- and then like come back and yeah. everybody has gone away, grown up and come back together. That yeah. I think there's a level of appreciation and relationship possible yeah. with that, like sabbatical yeah. that is maybe not possible when a band never goes away. Yeah. And, and I would say that the, the stages of the fandom, right. When I was 14, it was about, Oh my God, I love Joey McIntyre. I mm-hmm. want to be Jennifer McIntyre when I grow yes. up. And when they reunited, it was, Oh my God, I'm 14 again. I mm-hmm. want to be Jennifer McIntyre, even though I'm married and he's married. And <laughs> yeah. And then it went to the, oh my goodness, he was my first celebrity crush and, you know, kind of getting nervous and meet and greets to now it's like, Hey Joe, what's up? And joking. And, and it's not about like, Oh, I love you, Joey. I want to be Jennifer McIntyre about, it's not about that anymore. It's just about a connection and an outlet and having something that's for me and being able to put everything else to the side for a time and enjoy my me time, my Mm -hmm. time with my friends, with these guys that provide this great outlet. And that's really what it's about. And I, and to me, I think everyone should have that thing. Yes. That's what I think is so great about your podcast. Thank you. Everyone should have that thing that they love Mm -hmm. and are passionate about. And is an outlet that has nothing to do with working with their career, with family or anything. That's just about enjoyment and having that release. And so to me, that's, that's what it's all about. Really. Uh, 
Fantastic. Well, Jen, this has been a blast. It's good. It's so nice to catch up with you. Me too. I wish, I mean, I do wish we were in Barcelona having this conversation, but. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) One day. One day. We'll return. Um, (laughs) So thank you and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.